And so let me go over uh, vibrational spectrometers. And so in this, uh, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum and the energy that's given off by hot objects, which gives us infrared light. So we, we can think of infrared light as heat because it's typically what, how we detect it. We feel hot on our face. We have, um, we have a couple of different ways of transferring energy um, in terms of heat. And we'll get into that in thermodynamics in the spring if you take that course, and I highly recommend it. Uh, that, that you have collisional transfer of heat or convective transfer of heat, and that's from atom or molecule to molecule banging into each other. Okay, And then you have radiative transfer of heat. And if you're ever at a campfire and your face is just burning off, you know, you've got a hot bed of coals there, um, it's not convective or it's not collisional because that would be the hot, smoky, you know, uh, gases coming up and hitting your face. Just put your hands in front of your face and your face feels instantly cool. And what you're doing is you're blocking that infrared light. That's radiative transfer of heat to your face. And so you can detect that infrared with your face, okay? Um, once you get used to the background and you go stand in front of a hot object, you can feel that heat. But it's radiation. It's just like any other kind of electromagnetic radiation, only it's in the infrared region. We don't see it with our eyes, but we can feel it with our uh, you know, skin. That's not to say that you should stick your face in the infrared spectrometer and say, is the beam on? <laughs> but we do have little polymers that change color with, uh, with heat, and we can put them in the beam, and you can see the little spot develop. Um, so it's kind of nice. Then we get into dispersive versus interferometry uh, spectrometers, interferometric. Um, and then we'll talk about the different transitions, which you're pretty well familiar with right now. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, in general, you should memorize this uh, graph in general terms, like from gamma rays, like in this order, what's the highest energy, what's the lowest energy. So this, this is sort of uh, like memorizing your your way back home, you know, something you learned as a little kid <laughs> and you don't have to be, you don't have to put any effort into it. So you should definitely know that this is the way the general categories of radiation um, are ordered. So this is the highest energy here. This is gamma rays that comes out of nuclear transformations. And then you have X-rays, which come from core electrons. Then you have UV and visible, which are valence electrons. Then infrared, we have vibrations of molecules. Microwave, we have some rotations. And then radio waves, we use this for spectroscopy for nuclear spin uh, in a magnetic field, so NMR nuclear magnetic resonance, okay? So we still use radio waves in spectroscopy, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's because our magnetic fields uh, are pretty weak. They, they cause a splitting of the, of the nuclear spin, and then we get a small Boltzmann distribution change in ground state to uh, upper state, and then we can do spectroscopy with it. But the energy difference is really small, so we have to use radio frequency. It's pretty cool at UT, they had 100 megahertz um, NMR, and that meant that was the, the frequency at which the protons would precess in this instrument. And then they had a 100 megahertz radio station, KUT. And so they had the radio station, they had the, the instrument hooked up to the antenna of the radio in the lab, and it's playing the UT radio station, and then they would ping the protons in the NMR, and you could hear the proton signal on the radio station. It was turning the protons into an audible sound, and it would sound like a, like a bell. And so they would ping the protons in their little TMS sample, and the radio playing the music would stop and go, Bee! and you could hear the protons precessing in that magnetic field. It was really cool. Uh, anyway, I got so geeked out by that. <laughs> and, uh, and you could shim the magnet so that it would be a good signal or a bad signal. And if it was a bad signal and they hit um, ping, you know, it would go plink, you know, like you're hitting a, uh, like a brake drum or something, something really not resonant. Uh, but then if they got it shimmed just right and all of those protons were in the same magnetic field, then it would ring for a few seconds. It was very cool. But, but we're in the vibrational area, so we're in this middle infrared region, the 400 to 4,000 wave number region. Okay. 
And so here's the those spectroscopic regions that I talked about, which um, have some sources here, the energy range, frequency, wavelength, and so on. So this is all of the different spectroscopic techniques that we have available to us, and we're going to be talking about the, the near-infrared today. Now these are essential equations. See the blinking star? And as we move into our labs and you start using uh, your analysis of spectra to get out physical constants, you don't want to hamper your precision by just using the speed of light as three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, you want to use the full set of significant figures that are determined by um, our standards organizations. So these are from uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and look at the, all of the significant figures we have for these. Like here's Avogadro's number. You know it as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, but look, there's four more digits associated with it. And so this right here now will give you eight significant figures and you're not gonna have eight significant figures in your experimental data. Okay, so you want this to be more precise than your experimental data. Let's say you had a shot at getting five significant figures in your experimental data, but you used four significant figures for your constants. You've kind of shot yourself in the foot. You did all that work and now you're kind of throwing away some of that precision because you're using um, uh, you know, a lazy constant. So use all of these in your labs. Here's the speed of light, 299.792458 meters per second. I got that memorized because it was a cheat code on a game. You can help you build really fast. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun. It's a good cheat code if you ask me. Um, and then here's Planck's constant and so on. Now these other equations, they should be a part of you. Like, you know, what's new? C over lambda, that kind of thing. Uh, because these you use so often, like what's wave numbers, one over lambda in, wave, in centimeters, and, and what's um, you know the frequency in terms of energy or energy in terms of wavelength and so on. So you should be able to use all of these equations even without your note card, because these are fundamental. These are like the, you know, the five vowels, A, E, I, O, U. They, you shouldn't be needing to be reminded of those. But you can put them on your note card no matter what, because people do stupid things on exams, right? <laughs> like get on there and freak out. But still, these should be so much a part of you that, that you really shouldn't need them. Um, so let me just reemphasize that. Let's talk a little bit. This is really covered in detail in instrumental is the different types of spectrometers. But I want to hit two different types here, uh, just as a review if you've had instrumental or as a preview if you haven't, or if you're taking it right now. There's dispersive instruments and there's interferometric instruments. And so we'll talk about both of those. In this case, this is a dispersive spectrometer. We have a beam that's coming in either from the sample or the reference. So the source is over here somewhere. So you have a source, sample, and then it's coming in to this detector. So we, we want to split the light that's coming through our sample um, into its component wavelengths, and then we want to detect those one at a time. We really can't detect a wavelength one at a time. There's some resolution here that's governed by this slit. And so we're going to get a small delta lambda if we have a tight slit. And if we have uh, big wide slits, we'll get lots of light through and it'll be a really imprecise measurement, um, a, a large delta lambda. But but this right here, this, this piece here is what governs that uncertainty in our line shape formula. Remember we had the Gaussian and Lorentzian and Voigt and log normal, and they all had some delta lambda associated with it. And that's that's, typically limited by your spectrometer. So your spectrometer is the largest delta lambda. And so it's gonna be the thing that governs your line shape. And these are slow because we have to move the grating or the prism. And so we sit there and look for a while at a particular wavelength that's called the time constant and then we move it. And then we look for a little bit longer and we move it and look for, and so we take uh, um, measurements at each wavelength. And if we want high resolution, there's not very much light. And so we have to sort of build up our signal and we have to go very slowly. Uh, so later on, the um, infrared, the highest resolution spectrum we have is the, infra, uh, is the visible spectrum of iodine, the last lab in the course. And that spectrum took over 30 minutes to collect. You just sit at a wavelength and move very slowly and collect all of that tiny little light coming through those narrow slits um, into the detector. 
Now you can speed things up by taking this slit and detector out and putting in this diode array where it's like a camera element. You have lots of little detectors on here. And it's really common now to have 4,096 detectors. And so it's a little camera element. And so you can put that in there and then all of the wavelengths are hitting their individual detectors. The problem with that is <laughs> every one of these detectors is slightly different. So this can be noisy. Okay. And so you, you can have a really sensitive detector that gives a lot of noisy signal and you can have a really insensitive one that gives a very low signal. And so you take a background scan and then you can take a sample scan and a reference scan and you can kind of subtract out that noise. But the diode arrays can be pretty noisy and they're not as sensitive as say a photomultiplier tube. So this, there's still some use for a scanning instrument, especially for kinetics where you can sit on a particular wavelength for a long time and look at the decay curve. And so this is uh, really helpful, certainly for kinetics experiments. So the resolution depends over here, either on the grading in the slits here or the number of diodes on the array. So that's two different ways to get your delta lambda to be small, okay? The source image can limit it because again, the, the the size of the source going through all of the mirrors and everything getting to the detector, it can also limit your resolution to some degree. Okay, let's talk about interferometric spectrometers. So this is a picture of a Michelson interferometer and it gives an interferogram. So these are the vocabulary words. This is the instrument is the interferometer. The data that comes out of it is an interferogram. And what it measures is intensity versus mirror displacement. So if you're looking at this, you have, uh, you have intensity versus mirror displacement in centimeters. And the displacement is right here. You can see that this mirror moves back and forth and we see this intensity curve. And it's a really funny looking shape. We'll see one in, in the next slide. And then the, the fast Fourier transform, uh, this fast part actually comes from the digitized data. It was a computer science student that looked at, at the um, Fourier transform and also realized that the data was digitized and they figured out a scheme which really just um, relabels the memory addresses and you get a Fourier transform. And so this was a, a computer science paper and yet it revolutionized chemistry. <laughs> so that's pretty cool that this uh, sort of esoteric paper in, in computer science talking about if you just rearrange the memory addresses, you get a Fourier transform of whatever's stored in those memory addresses that we can do Fourier transform very quickly as long as the number of data points is a multiple of two because you're swapping pairs of addresses. And so as long as you have your data as a multiple of two, then you can do the fast Fourier transform. And that revolutionized infrared spectroscopy with the uh, Fourier transform infrared and also several other instruments that turned into fast Fourier transform instruments like NMR. So we, we um, definitely took advantage of that computer science development. And what happens is you invert the, the X axis. So it goes from centimeters to inverse centimeters, which is wave numbers. And so then you get this spectrum. So the intensity here is a frequency intensity, right? It's, it's waves per centimeter. And down here you have that particular wave number value shows up as a peak. <clears throat> now down here, the, the resolution is, is related to the distance that the mirror moves, the difference in path length. And so the maximum path difference uh, is in the denominator here. And so if we have a, a two centimeter path length, and so if this moves out two centimeters more than this fixed mirror, so let us say that, that, let's just say this is, um, let's just say this is four centimeters. And then this right here is four centimeters. And then we have an additional two centimeters. So that's again, that 
that longer path, then we can have a, a quarter wave number resolution, which is pretty good wave, wave number resolution. Our, our liquid samples, the peaks are typically between uh, four and, and, and 10 wave numbers wide. And so here we have a quarter of a wave number resolution. When I was in graduate school, I was doing gas phase infrared spectroscopy, and we had uh, an opportunity to go up to Pacific Northwest Laboratories to use their um, FTIR. And they had a research grade, the highest resolution FTIR uh, that, that is made, and it's a Bruker instrument, and it had a six meter path length. And so this the infrared spectrometer was down here in say the corner of the room, and then the interferometer went all the way down you know, for six meters, and they had the the mirror, the moving mirror on a little carousel and a cable that pulled it all the way down there and all the way back. And it, it took that long to take a spectrum of six meters, this thing moving a few centimeters a minute. And, and so that had a one thousandth of a wave number resolution so, so that you could see the widths of those gas phase peaks. So here's the uh, Fourier transformation. So up, up top we have the interferogram and down below we have the spectrum. And so let's look at the interferogram. When there's zero displacement, let's let's talk just a second up back here. So look at the, the interferogram and how it works. So the source, all of the wavelengths of light are coming here to this beam splitter. You have long wavelengths of light and short wavelengths of light, okay? And at that beam splitter, it's a, it's a piece of salt because we're dealing with infrared light and it's had a little bit of metal sputtered on it just enough metal to reflect half of the light. And so 50% of the light is reflected, just statistically, and the other light just happens to go right through. It misses parts of the metal coating and goes right through. So we have 50% of that light going up and 50% of that light going straight. So these, these wavelengths, the long one and the short one, go through and go up. and come back. So they take these two different paths and when they come back to the beam splitter, if there's zero difference in the distance of those mirrors, then they recombine at 100% and they come on through the sample. Okay. Now, if that moving mirror moves a half of a wavelength for a particular wavelength. So like the long, let's say the long wavelength, it moves half of one of those long wavelengths. Then when the long wavelength gets back, it's 180 degrees out of phase with the path that went the short way. And so when they combine, they cancel each other out. And that's what an interferogram is. It's canceling it out. It's interfering with the light and it's wavelength dependent. So you move this mirror and you interfere with certain wavelengths of light. Now, when the mirror distance is the same, you get all of the wavelengths recombining. So look at these two red and, and, and blue curves. At zero distance, they're at a maximum, and so they add together and they make this center burst, we call it, where all the wavelengths are back in phase and none of them cancel out. If we move, in this case, the mirror one centimeter, notice the red is back up at the top and is going to recombine with the red wavelengths that went both directions. But the blue, one went up and down, the other one went a little bit further and came back, and now it's out of phase. And so the blue and, the, and the, this original red will cancel out, and you get zero intensity. You go a little further, and the blue and the red meet back up, and they're back up here at a high intensity. And, and so when you're looking at this, you get this dark black signal, the interferogram. So you have the center burst, and then you have all of the interference of waves going out to each end. If you do the fast Fourier transform on that, it inverts the x-axis. So the centimeters is now wave numbers. So that's what you get from the Fourier transform of these data, is that you invert the x-axis, and now we get two peaks. Now, if you're looking at this, this up here, this mirror displacement, can you label these two peaks? So can you label the x-axis looking at this? Essentially, look at the, the number of waves we have per centimeter. So right here is one centimeter. This red one goes down 
and back up in one centimeter. So what is its wave number value? It's one wave per centimeter. And so it's one, okay? And so we'll just pick this one here and call that one. So that's the red one. This one goes down and it's, and then back up in two centimeters. So it's got half of a wave number, half of a wave in one centimeter. So this is 0.5 and that's the blue one. So if we were to take the interferogram, the, the Fourier transform of that black interferogram and we would get two peaks and one would be the red associated with that red frequency and another one would be associated with that blue frequency and they would show up at those two points. Now in this whole set of uh, spectroscopy techniques, the infrared, uh, we're dealing with vibrational motion. And so this, um, if the oscillating light corresponds to this vibrational motion, then it can absorb that light. And so here's a sort of, if you were to open the lid of my infrared spectrometer, this is what you would see, at least in terms of its layout. You have the infrared source. Uh, it's a, it's, it's like a resistor, a ceramic resistor that heats up. So we just run a stable amount of uh, current through that and it reaches a certain temperature and that emits our infrared light. It goes through our interferometer. It uses, our particular one uses these cube corner mirrors. Um, we can talk about that if you're curious. Um, so it recombines at the beam splitter. Then there's some mirrors that bounce it around. Infrared spectrometers typically use only mirrors not lenses, because uh, the lenses would have to be made out of salt because glass absorbs infrared. So once you write that down, because that's important for your lab in a couple of weeks, glass absorbs infrared light. So we have to use salt optics. We do have a couple of windows in this instrument right here in the sample chamber, and those are salt windows. Please don't touch, <laughs> okay? And they're pretty, it's pretty brutal here in Huntsville for those salt windows. In a few years, they start fogging up because of the humidity. And then we have this attachment that we put into the sample chamber called the attenuated total reflectance attachment, which has a diamond in it. Okay, so there's a diamond right there. and we press our sample or put it in a little liquid cup so that it's touching the top of that diamond and the light comes in underneath. And so here's the ATR phenomenon. You can think of this diamond crystal as a trampoline. You have seen a trampoline, right? Okay. And so that trampoline surface um, vibrates up and down as the infrared light comes in. So the infrared light comes in, hits this mirror, goes up and hits the bottom of that trampoline and is reflected into the detector. So all of these wavelengths are coming and making that trampoline bounce. And you might have something like water on top of that trampoline. And at a particular frequency, those hydrogens can oscillate with that bouncing surface. Now the light's not actually going into the water, it's reflecting at the end, at the, where that diamond ends, that surface of electrons is oscillating at the infrared frequencies. And water's on top and it's oscillating at, the same, at particular frequencies and it will steal some of the light. So it will, it will take some of that oscillation from that vibrating surface and then that light is missing at the detector. So that's the attenuated part. Attenuated means turned down. Like if you attenuate the volume, you're turning down the volume. And so that's what that vibration is doing. It's attenuating the signal that's hitting the detector. Um, it's total reflectance because the light's totally reflected inside that diamond. It's at the right angle. It's called a Brewster's angle. And 100% of the light is reflected. Um, and it, and it, it just vibrates the surface of the diamond and then whatever is pressed against the diamond can attenuate certain frequencies if there's a vibrational um, excitation. And it shows up, essentially gives you the infrared spectrum, the vibrational spectrum of that substance. If it's pressed closely onto that diamond, that's probably the number one sampling technique though, is, uh, 
is is ATR because you don't have to. In the past, you had to take your sample and dissolve it or, or um, grind it up with potassium bromide, and then you had to press that into a little pellet, and then you could put that pellet in the infrared beam, and the infrared beam would go through your sample that way. It was a real pain. First of all, K KBR in Huntsville is awful because it's so humid. And so you start to grind this salt, and it starts to get wet. And so then your crystal is foggy because it has so much water in it. And so you have to do it in some sort of humidity controlled glove box or something like that. It's really a very big pain. Um, and then you get too much sample in there and your peaks are off scale. Or you don't get enough and they're too small. Okay. Or you get it just right and you think this is the one and you put it in there and it cracks in half. <laughs> okay. And so the KBR pellets, you talk to an old timer who had to do them. I, I, I came in right as they were leaving. So really, you know, someone in their 60s or whatever would tell you that it was awful. And this is revolutionary. You just put your little powder on top, press it onto the diamond, and hit go. And it's really very good, especially those in forensics. That's the way to go it's with ATR. Now, what's going on in the infrared absorption is we're hitting all of the fundamentals. So for the particle in a box, we had one quantum number. For the vibrational spectrum of a molecule, we had 3n minus 6 quantum numbers. Okay. So all of these right here, we have 3n minus 6 quantum numbers. And if you'll notice, I've got these levels here and lines. Remember, I'm always pointing that difference out. You have an energy level diagram, and then you have the spectral lines. And the spectral lines show up at the differences of those. So you can kind of think of the spectrum as being sideways. See over here, this spectrum is sideways, and wherever there's a peak, that corresponds to this energy difference. And so hopefully this, this picture here, this slide, will give you a concept of what's going on in the spectrum for fundamental transitions. So right here, we have all of our quantum numbers equal to zero, ground state. But if we want to excite that molecule in nu1, so the, the V1 equals 1, so the vibrational frequency nu1, is excited and all the others are still in the ground state and that shows up at 750 wave numbers different so there's a peak there and then if we just excite the second fundamental new two and all of the others are still in the ground state so new one we're telling this is a different molecule different photons being absorbed by a different molecule and this one was in the ground state with everything and now v equals uh, v v2 Vibrational frequency, too, is now excited, and its fundamental is around 900 wave numbers. And so there's different molecules absorbing this light and different molecules absorbing that light and different molecules. We have a lot of molecules. The, you know, a good detection limit is like 10 to the 13 molecules. <laughs> That's considered good. That's how many molecules you need to get a good signal. It's 10 to the 13, roughly. So we have a lot. A billion is nothing. You can't even detect a billion molecules, typically. So we have a thousand billion would be 10 to the 12, okay? So we have 10,000 billion molecules. <laughs> so that's that's a lot. And and so then uh, here's uh, new three is this the fundamental for new three and then the fundamental for new four is up here. And so this this spectrum that we see would be as the as we scan the monochromator, we're scanning the lengths of those arrows. And when the length of that arrow hits a, a fundamental transition, then a lot of that light disappears. And that's when we see an absorbance peak. And then our spectrometer moves off of that and it doesn't see any absorption because we're between the levels. And then we get close to another level and some of that light starts to disappear. And as we scan that monochromator, we're scanning that arrow, making it longer, and it hits another level, and then we see some light missing, and we get an absorbance peak. Yes? So everything up there that looks like the beam No, these are Vs. These are, these are the quantum number Vs. So V1 equals 1, V2 equals 1, or what have you. But the, the peak that we call it, we would call it nu1 or nu2. That would be the frequency. So let me do this 750 right here, this 750 that I've drawn would be new one and it have a tilde on top and you would say new one 
Okay, so that's how you, that's what you would say down here in quotes. That makes sense. It, it yeah, with the V's and the news, it's confusing. So I appreciate you always asking that. So that's new one at 750 wave numbers. But if we were going to draw out the you know quantum numbers, that would be V1 would be the quantum number for that transition, as opposed to V2 or V3 or V4. And so that's in the near mid infrared. Uh, Raman, so these vibrations occur in the mid infrared in this region here. Raman uses visible light to detect the vibrations. So this, this is an important point. And the reason it's important is because glass is transparent to visible light. You know, a, not if it's not amber glass, <laughs> right? So clear glass is clear. It's, it's transparent to visible light. So we can use uh, our samples in vials for Raman spectroscopy. So we can shoot visible lasers in through a glass vial and we never have to touch the sample. So in infrared, because we have to actually take the sample out and put it onto the ATR, we are in contact with the sample, which could be a problem. Like benzene is carcinogenic. So if we're going to take an infrared, we have to actually open the carcinogen, put a drop on there. It's evaporating. We're breathing it in. We're getting some minute exposure. The toxin is the dose, so it's not very much. But if you were working on this day in, day out, ramen would be preferable because you don't have to open the lid. You can leave it in a glass vial and you can shoot the visible laser through and get the vibrational information of benzene through a glass vial. That's fantastic. Another thing that's fantastic about Raman is that lasers typically go in a straight line. And so I can shoot a laser through my sample and detect its Raman spectrum without ever even going close to it. And that's really good if you're doing combustion research. So if you have a flame, you can shoot a laser through it and you can get Raman spectra out of that flame and you never have to get in there with a probe. You, have to, you don't have to put anything there that can withstand the temperatures. You don't have to disturb the gases. So uh, combustion research used Raman a lot. Um, it's typically non-destructive. If it absorbs the Raman light, it can be destroyed. Um, so lots of things. Now it's Raman, not Ramen. <laughs> okay. So there's a big difference. Uh, it's not the noodles. It's, uh, it's a fellow who won the Nobel Prize in 1930. He used sunlight and a filter in the human eye. So he was looking at, he put a he put a blue filter on top, so only blue light came through, and he put a red filter on the side. So it should be dark, right? And he looks in the box, and he sees red light coming out. And he's like, how did that happen? You know, and so he labeled this effect the Raman effect and got the Nobel Prize. So it's pretty neat. It came, became much more popular with, the, with lasers. Here's me in grad school working with our Raman setup. That's a laser table over there on the right. And this is an ND YAG laser, a neodymium YAG laser. And the amount of light coming out of that little hole is very dangerous. <laughs> there was a, a similar system that a, that a person was lining up with. Our advisor put this warning on the wall. Um, they were aligning the optics with the laser at full power. And their thumbnail got into the beam and it reflected enough light to blind them. Yeah, so you can put a lot of power through these pulsed lasers. Uh, it, of course, also like burned his thumbnail like incredibly bad, but the biggest problem was his lo loss of sight. He had, a, he had a blind spot right in the middle because he's looking down and it shot right in one eye. And so he just had a spot right where you look that was not sensitive anymore. Um, so he told us, don't ever align the laser at full power. Uh, look at all the hair I had. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in Oregon, Oregon State, and uh, Mama, was, Mama always sent me these Texas t-shirts. So that's a shirt with a big jalapeno. It says jalapeno, like pain. It's one of my favorite shirts. Um, the, this is uh, water-cooled. You see that big umbilical cord down here at the bottom? Um, it's a water-cooled instrument. So we had water going up and cooling the flash lamps. And this box right here was about the size of a dishwasher that had the power supply in it. And the power supply had uh, these, look like milk carton uh, capacitors to cause the flash lamps to go. It was like these uh, arc lamps that would shoot an arc about six inches, um, needed a lot of electricity to do that. So you could unplug this instrument and those jugs, it said on the side, contains a lethal charge. 
So like just that capacitor would be enough to kill you. Um, and so anytime we were going to do maintenance inside there, uh, you had to ground out those capacitors. So we had a screwdriver that we would put across the top of those capacitors. And it sounded like a shotgun going off. You know, you put it in there and go, pow, and it would melt the end of the screwdriver off every time. So it was it was only for this. So the end was gone. And they always made the, the new grad students do that. It was like a rite of passage. It's like, okay, ground up the capacitors. Just put it in there and touch. So you reach in this cabinet that says high voltage. You're not in there. You know, all the business. You go in there and you do this. Pow! And every time, you know, like people bang their head on the inside of the instrument. It's like, pow! And you bang your head. And then everybody had to do it. <laughs> it was great. Great fun. So, but now we have diode lasers. And so we got away from these these high powered, I mean, they still use them in some research, but we got away from these water cooled um, lasers and we have these modern Raman lasers that are diode lasers. These instruments are portable. You can go to the crime scene, you see a white powder, you separate it from the rest of the white powder and you can sit this probe on there and you can get a spectrum of it. That's a really important um, tool. That would mainly be for like first responders. Is this a white powder? It could be a drug or it could also be an explosive. And so we need to determine what we're dealing with. Is it a clandestine drug lab or a clandestine explosives lab? And so you need to be able to determine what, how careful you need to be moving forward. If it's just a drug lab, regular PPE, sweep things in the bags, seal it up, send it to the lab. If it's an explosives lab, some of these explosives are incredibly sensitive, meaning shock sensitive. So if you touch them with the wrong thing, then you can get a detonation and you could lose eyes, fingers, or even lives. So you gotta know what you're dealing with. So Raman spectroscopy is a two photon process. We've covered this quite a bit in the past, but just to reemphasize it. And, and so this is visible light so remember, we're dealing with this is this huge energy transition here. This 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 photon of light is in the visible region, but down here it's measuring something that's in the infrared. So these are fundamental transitions that we're measuring with this scattered light. <clears throat> so Stokes shift is a red shift. And they're red shifted because there's some energy missing. So the green light comes into the sample and red light comes out. And the energy that's missing is that vibrational energy. And so the molecule is now excited. Uh, you can get anti-stoke shift, you can get blue shifted light if you have hot molecules, but we don't really deal with molecules that are that hot. A 3000 wave number transition, um, oh, I used to know the temperature. It's, it's thousands of Kelvin. Okay, so you're not going to have an organic compound survive to thousands of Kelvin. So you're not going to get anti-Stokes uh, shifted light from, from these molecules, not directly. And so you have a peak associated with every fundamental if it's, if it's symmetry allowed. Okay, and so we have lots of red shifted photons. We have, say, uh, you know, for for nu one or nu two, all the way up to three n minus six. We have all of those different vibrational levels. And here's the symmetry, you know, setup. You would have the fundamental, so the ground state, the first excited state, and then all of those um, second order interactions of the two photons. And here's the energy level and line diagram that we see. So you have the, whenever you see this up and down arrow, you're dealing with Raman or Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering goes back down to the level it started in, and the Raman scattering has a different level. Do you see that? So these are Raman right here. I need to fix the pipes. You hear that? This crash me crazy. Okay, so this is the, the Raman scattered light. And so we're sitting with the detector now. This is the diode array, and we detect photons that are coming out at this frequency and nothing here. And then we detect Rom Raman photons coming out at this frequency and nothing in between because that's where those vibrational energy levels are. So we see the Raman effect spit out red shifted photons at particular frequencies. And those frequencies happen to correspond to the fundamentals. And so we can put these spectra right on top of each other. Um, here's a sort of 
a schematic of the ramen. We hit the sample with a laser. It's incredibly bright. And most of the laser light scattered off or goes through the sample and is thrown away. And so we have to get rid of the Rayleigh scattered light and we need to look at this this little bit that's Raman scattered. It's like a one in a billion chance. So out of every billion laser photons that hit the sample, maybe one photon is scattered by Raman. Uh, so these can tell this wouldn't be a very tech good technique without a laser. Lasers put out so much light in a particular direction. Um, this is a little better picture of the same instrument. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Let's go ahead and do this calculation. So this 532 nanometer light, if we're going to talk about infrared, we want to deal in wave numbers. And so we want to convert this to wave numbers. So remember that wave number is equal to 1 over lambda in centimeters. And so we just need to take um, 1 over 532 and convert that nanometer to centimeters. So we want nanometers on top, centimeters on bottom. And anytime we're doing a, a conversion in the metric system, we can just use these prefixes. Centi is 10 to the minus 2, and nano is 10 to the minus 9. So nano is 10 to the minus 9, centi is 10 to the minus 2. Make sure they're on opposite sides. <laughs> okay. And so this ends up being, if you take all of these powers of 10, it's 10 to the minus 2 minus a uh, negative 9, so it ends up being 10 to the 7th. So there's 10 to the 7th nanometers per centimeter, and that will get us our 18,000, um, something like 1880, wave numbers. So that's the, that's the um, wave number value for that incident photon, that green light that's coming in. And so what's the What's the Stokes wavelength? What's the light that comes out for, say, a CH stretch? So this right here, this is going to be what we call Raman shift value. Uh, we're going to run out of time. And so um, I'll take this, I'll do in and out, that'll help you, okay? And so this is 18,800. That's what's coming in. And then what's coming out See, the Raman shift, the vibrational frequency is 3,000 wave numbers. 18,000 is coming in, and what's coming out is the difference. The difference equals 3,000. Okay, and so this would be 15,800. The reason I'm doing this is because, again, glass would absorb 3,000 wave number light. So we can't get the CH stretch uh, uh, through glass, but we could send in 18,000 wave number light through glass and 15,000 wave number light could come out of glass. And if we take that difference, that's the 3,000 wave number stretch for, for a CH stretch. You see that? So these, these two go through glass. They're visible, okay? And so we take the difference of that light that we detect and subtract out our laser wavelength, and that difference is our vibrational frequencies. That's exactly what's being shown here with the arrows, but I just wanted to show you with the math. Okay. Okay, so we are out of time. We did all of these vibrations last time. Just wanted to show you the Raman and the IR really line up well. Okay.